right. Well, welcome to the Entheogenic Explorers podcast. I'm Kirby. I have with me Atira Tan, who is a TEDx speaker, activist, somatic and trauma specialist, number one best-selling author, yoga teacher, group facilitator, a powerful agent of transformation and change. I could continue to read her bio, but I'll just introduce her myself from somebody that's made a massive impact in my life and the ability of other facilitators to step on the scene and do our job without creating more trauma for folks. So I think that's a good enough introduction. How's that, Atira? How are you? Hi, Kirby. Thank you so much for the introduction. It was perfect. So happy to be here. Really happy to be here. And wanted to say welcome to the folks out there that are listening right now. Well, I appreciate it again when, um, you know, when I started this, you were the first person, obviously, that came to mind because what you're doing is, to me, the most impactful, um, you know, what we're seeing in this community or what we're seeing in the plant medicine world in general. You're the first person that I heard that was really standing up and speaking out um, in, in, in the world of like, look, this is this isn't just an experience. This is healing. Mm -hmm. And if it is going to be healing, we need to be better about it. So I appreciate you taking the time. Um, there's nobody better to answer these questions. So let's let's get into it. I know we have limited time with you, so I appreciate you giving it to us. Um, bottom line question is there's folks out there, obviously, they're looking for healing. They're looking for these experiences and they don't know what to do, where to go. You type in ayahuasca facility or a ceremony or psilocybin it, it, it's it's almost irrelevant like the entheogenics in, in general folks are looking for them they're hearing michael Pollan's book they understand like wow maybe there's an opportunity for me to get some healing as well but with that comes a lot of concerns right we're always hearing the, the good stories uh, 20 years of therapy in a weekend we're not hearing that some folks over the course of weekend could need 20 years of therapy if not done properly right so in your opinion, what are you seeing out there in the wild world of plant medicines, plant medicine retreats, facilitation that is both a positive and a concern to you? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for asking the question, Kirby. Uh, what I see in the plant medicine world today is that there are, you know, this is a, a kind of growing expansion, a field that's expanding rapidly. And, you know, we live in a world, I think, that is full of suffering and, you know, folks are looking uh, for the remedy and the antidote to that suffering. Um, I believe that in this world in, with facilitators and people who are offering this body of work, um, they do come with very, very good intentions. And I think that many of them uh, come from a place where they have experienced some kind of healing themselves and some kind of positive transformation and impact in your lives, and they would like to pass it on to others. However, you know, stepping into the role of a facilitator or a, a role of a healer, um, people come to these plant medicine experience to have reparative experiences. And this is a great responsibility. So my understanding is that not everybody, um, you know, with great responsibility takes a lot of, there are a lot of elements that go into being, uh, into facilitation and stepping also in the role of facilitator. So first of all is the education, you know, the education that might be missing, um, the experience, their own kind of um, relationship with the medicine, which is one of integrity. Uh, what I see kind of missing these days are, you know, perhaps there's some folks that have had impactful experiences from the medicine and they feel very excited about what they've done um, or what they've received from the medicine. And then after like maybe 10 ceremonies, they become a facilitator. Um, in, for example, you know, in the Shipibo tradition that I have mentored and trained with, in order to be a facilitator or perhaps a shaman working with the plant medicine of ayahuasca, you know, people get trained for decades, decades. And a lot of the time, the medicine is within their family and is passed down from grandmother to grandson or you know, somewhere, someone in the family has passed, passed this information and knowledge down and they start pretty young. Sometimes when they're 12 or 13 years old, they have to sit in dietas for many, many months at a time where it's very rigorous. 
Um, there's a lot of discipline that's kind of involved in these dietas. There is also a beautiful kind of legend that I would like to share that has really inspired me uh, in the path of facilitation. So in the Shipibo tradition, they believe that a person has to do, you know, probably a number of years at least in um, training and apprenticing with a master shaman. Um, but then the way that they're chosen is uh, they are given a test to eat a very um, spicy chili. And only when they poop the chili out and the chili seeds start to grow into a chili plant and that becomes, that actually bears chili itself, then that's kind of the chosen um, facilitator. And I really love this because it is a choice with nature. So through this test, it's not just a human being that is saying, I'm ready or you're ready, but it's actually, you know, nature itself, which is the fabric and the essence of the intelligence in plant medicine, um, you know, where a higher intelligence is actually saying, yes, you know, you're the right person, you're ready, you know, let's do this. In our Western world, um, that rigorous training and that discipline is not always there with facilitators. And I think that that can be, um, yeah, that can be, you know, at times dangerous or even harmful because when we enter an altered state of consciousness, um, there is a lot that happens in that space. And we tap into different realms emotionally, you know, spiritually, mentally, and if a facilitator perhaps doesn't understand the terrain of the altered state of consciousness or how the medicine works um, in its fullest capacity, it's very difficult to kind of navigate, um, you know, participants through it in a way that is reparative. Yeah. So I believe that I, what I see is that I appreciate the enthusiasm and I appreciate the kindness of heart where people would like to step step up into service because the world is full of suffering and we do need it. You know, we do need care and we do need support. However, I am have been kind of concerned about perhaps the lack of training, the lack of understanding and the lack of perhaps... Um, working on ourselves, working on our shadows, you know, um, really embodying that sense of integrity because the role of a facilitator is one of authority um, and it is one that bears a lot of weight. So that responsibility, I think, and that role, if not walked in integrity and if it is um, kind of tainted with perhaps uh, our, hmm, I don't know, um, our own kind of human egoic kind of tendencies it, that can actually be really um, re-traumatizing actually for participants, especially participants that have been through, you know, any kind of trauma, which is complex or developmental, or perhaps experience some kind of neglect and abuse at some point of their lives. Um, you know, having that mirror in a facilitator can be concerning and, and at times harmful and dangerous. I'll, I'll pop in briefly. And this is what I love about you and some of the difference between us. You're such a good, beautiful soul. Um, and, and you see it from the standpoint, um, which I agree, people have an experience they want to help for sure. Um, there's no question that's a leading piece. To me, I also see that part I'm not as concerned with. I think that leads them to it probably shouldn't be facilitating, but my concern in our culture is my family's indigenous. If I went to um, our group of people, the medicine man is, it's just the job almost. It's like, it's the med, it's not the whole tribe isn't like, oh my gosh, it's the medicine man, right? So we've created a specialness in our culture around these roles, these positions, these times, whatever, whatever you want to label them as. And so I see people see that in this state of, 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 of trauma and injury and say, wow, I could, I could step into that and then I can garner this, right? And it's an easy way, it could be seen as an easy way to be seen, right? It's an easy way to be seen, especially to your point where I think people do wanna help. So you get out of boys by helping somebody, right? Oh, thank you for that, thank you for that. 
you're not getting any attaboys who are working on yourself. Nobody comes up to you and says, good job, Kirby. You were really good yesterday with what you were doing and your thought doesn't happen. So it's a quick way to spiritually bypass some of our own work. Um, and I think that's why one of the trainings that you have the somatic integration, one of the requirements is to, for you to do your own journeys, right? Mm. 20 of your own journeys, because you not only have to understand yourself and these, uh, mm -hmm. these medicines as well, but so that's one of my concerns is we do, we're seeing people that see that role as something, well, what they don't see it is the amount of heavy responsibilities where I was going with it, that you brought up the heavy, heavy amount of responsibility for these participants sometimes is overlooked for this want to help and the specialness that may come from helping. How's that? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Witness this as well. And I think that part of it is because there are not enough, I think, role models um, for facilitators to really learn and mentor with. And my hope is that with the right education um, and also with the right awareness um, that can really be highlighted more and more with role models that are actually healthy, that really um, can model and, and that embodied sense of safety yeah uh with with folks that come to this work and what i also see that i might name is that there are a lot of um trauma um you know trauma is the new black basically you know in 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 uh for the past couple of years and and i really love that because this is a piece that's very very important in our culture and society to understand However, doing trainings, you know, in trauma and, you know, perhaps, you know, reading books and so on and so forth. Um, this is very, very helpful in the education of understanding trauma, but there is also a process that comes after that of embodiment, you know, where the field that you create as a facilitator that you walk in, uh, in a trauma informed way which is natural and it's organic and it's something that's already in your nervous system and it's a field that you create for your participants. And what I would love to see more of is the perhaps the minding of the gap between the information and the knowledge that we are learning now about trauma, which is so important, um, into more of an embodiment and um, facilitators perhaps walking um, yeah, walking the trauma-informed path. Firstly, towards themselves. I think that that's really important. The relationship with themselves can highlight a lot. Um, and also how they interact with their participants. So at this place, what I would really love to name, actually, I think that we're going to be talking about red flags and um, whatnot and green flags. But what I would like to share that I feel extremely concerning in the plant medicine world is this belief that has been highlighted a lot um, to me over and over again over the years is that if a person is going through a hard time that we should leave them alone and we should not you know, check on them. We should just leave them alone because they are just in their own journey. We should not quote unquote interfere with the medicine. Um, and this is a myth, I think, a plot medicine myth that I would really like to bust in our podcast. Um, yeah. So at this juncture, I would like to share that, you know, trauma is not something that just happens through abuse. It's actually something that happens through neglect. And neglect highlights what a person might have been missing during, you know, an experience which was overwhelming and their nervous system could not process and this can especially happen when we are growing up as children, you know, developmentally um, for folks that have experienced some kind of complex PTSD or complex trauma, or relational trauma in any way, especially when they were growing up or what we call adverse childhood experiences, they, you, it's pretty probable that they have experienced some kind of neglect where their needs were not met, they were not supported, they were not cared for adequately. And therefore, you know, that actually led to a freeze. So this kind of myth, I think, in the plant medicine world, especially when somebody is going through distress, and if they are, you know, asking for support, or if the facilitator knows that they're going through a hard time, and they are being left alone, 
um, this is this actually heightens their distress and ultimately leads to re-traumatization slash traumatization in that space. So there is a balance here that I would like to also name. My belief is that a trauma-informed facilitator who is um, trained and who knows the landscape of the plant medicine world will know what to do and the amount of support to offer an individual when they are going through distress. And, you know, we're not going to smother and hover over somebody that needs support because that, as you know, that might um, be re traumatizing as well. But we don't want to leave them alone. So that balance and that dance of, you know, understanding the repair that a person needs based on the distress that they're going through in the plant medicine experience is a very tender and is a very delicate and is a very sensitive space. Um, and one of the things that participants, I think, need to look for is, is that, is, is whether, you know, seeing signs of whether a facilitator is attuned to a person, uh, their needs, their emotions. Um, another thing is to see signs of whether a facilitator offers an introduction session if a person wants to book in for a ceremony, um, if they offer that option, because I really do feel with harm reduction, it's very, very important for the facilitator to offer a confidential one-on-one -on -one, you know, consultation or orientation to meet the person, to actually understand the person's history, their background, the trauma they, they have experienced, you know, their boundaries, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, um, the support that they need, so on and so forth, um, before actually the ceremonial experience. If a facilitator doesn't offer that, or if you know a participant asks for that and it's not being offered, that would be a red flag. Because ultimately, if that is not offered, the facilitator is walking into you know, a space where they actually don't really have a lot of information about the client and therefore they are using assumption. I believe that a responsible facilitator would want to um, share as much or know as, as much information as they can about a person if they care about the person because everybody is different and every trauma imprint is different and people usually come to plant medicine to heal, which means that we are entering a trauma vortex. If you don't have any information of what that trauma vortex is, it can be a lot more challenging to understand as a facilitator you know, what this person might need or the repair that they might need um, that can be the antidote to the suffering that they're going through. So this is the first kind of um, tip I think that I would like to share with the audience out there is if you are a participant, notice if your facilitator offers orientation calls or meetings. And if they don't, you know, see if you can request for one. And if they say no, I would say that that is a red flag because you're going to be entering a space where the facilitator doesn't really know anything about you or your background, your history, your strengths, your resources. And there is no kind of relationship that you have with the facilitator and relationships, especially with re relational trauma and complex imprints are really, really important. You know, that is where trust and safety is built when you meet somebody and you actually build a relationship and when that there is, you know, that's dismissed or that's avoided, that's a red flag, I think. Um, so that's the first one. Yeah, just to tap on the piece that you touched on. Um, that was my first experience with 5MEO is I called the folks, I was supposed to fly to Florida, fly. So it was gonna be a, a, an, an event. They didn't have 15 minutes to talk to me on the phone, canceled the mm. trip. Like we're about to engage in the, the strongest psychedelic on the planet and you don't have 15 minutes to have a mm -hmm. conversation with me. This doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but also to something that you brought up earlier and I, I wanna give the, the majority of the floor to you is that piece as you see that in ceremony where if somebody's having a difficult time, um, this 
myth, I love how you said it, is, is a myth of let the medicine do the work. That it's, it's the medicine and what I'm finding that's usually somebody that's unqualified, right? That doesn't have the tools to guide that person through that or mm -hmm. to hold the space for them properly. And then to your point, I mean, it, when folks are in these circumstances, they're completely opened up. And, and what I learned is the smallest things could have such an amazing impact on them, but those mm -hmm. same small things could have a traumatic impact on them. Everything mm -hmm. is so important. Every word that's coming out of your mouth, every mm -hmm. movement, everything has to be really dialed in. So the mm -hmm. embodiment of that is super important. Um, but that's one of my concerns. I've been to ceremonies where that is the case. And that usually tells me that they're just not qualified to help those folks. Mm -hmm. I guess the question would be, and just to maybe a yes or no, would, would the participant be better off not having them interact with them if they're unqualified or having somebody unqualified interact with them? I, I don't know. I'm just, yeah. Neither is a good option. <laughs> I think that the answer is it, it depends. It really depends on the participant and their intention and what they're kind of looking for um, through the experience. And I think that um, every intention is valid. Um, but to be on the safety side, um, and I would like to talk about the second tip that I would like to share in our podcast today. Um, what is really, I think, important as a participant is to know that you have choice and agency in every moment because that is really truly the antidote to trauma um, because trauma happens when we are out of control and we do not feel that we have choice and agency in our relationship with ourselves and also how we respond with the world. And knowing that when we have choice and agency um, is also around attuning to whether a person feels whether you feel safe with a person or not. So if you notice that a person is kind of, you know, showing signs of not being qualified, um, and if you're not feeling, you know, safe about that, I would really encourage and strongly suggest for folks to say no. Yeah, and to, you know, um, spend some time looking for the right person. Um, it can be very traumatic when we are in, you know, a, an altered state of consciousness experience and we do not feel safe in the group. And on, you know, being in an altered state of consciousness that can really exacerbate, um, you know, our relationship, you know, in, in the ceremony. Yeah, a rela relationship to what's happening in the ceremony. So I tend to err on the, and, and you know, lean on the side of kind of, you know, um, being cautious um, because uh, our safety actually really is very, very important and essential, especially when we want to enter these spaces to heal. And, you know, I have seen, you know, as an integration practitioner, I've seen, you know, so many people, you know, um, in integration, and it only takes one, you know, facilitator um, that violates some kind of boundaries in a way to actually spin people who are already struggling and, you know, in perhaps a, a destabilized place in themselves, it can actually spin them out um, into greater suffering for a prolonged period of time. And I really don't want that to happen to anybody. And I think that everybody matters in this work. Um, so, yeah, what I would really encourage for people is to actually tune in into their bodies and notice that, you know, if you see any signs of, you know, not being qualified or if there are any triggers that arise, um, I would prefer, I would encourage them to be cautious and to um, perhaps, you know, look at other options. Um, the other thing that I would also, you know, uh, look out for in facilitators are, um, you know, we come, you know, the plant medicine world is a spiritual world. It really opens up this spiritual kind of gateway. And I think that a lot of participants who come to this work really want to connect to something bigger than themselves. And I think that that's very important. However, there is a shadow and a light side in the spiritual community. And, um, you know, some of the shadow parts that I would like to name as signs to kind of also kind of look out for are a lot of spiritual bypassing and avoidance and disassociation also can happen in um, the, the kind of plant medicine community. And you will 
you know, notice that in the language that, um, you know, facilitators or people, folks are, are, are speaking about. So everything is love, don't give in to the fear, so on and so forth. Or perhaps, you know, positive sizing statements that actually negate our humanity and negate how we feel. Um, so I would really also encourage folks to look out for that kind of behavior or language as well, because it, you know, like saying things like this is your responsibility or saying, OK, you did some, you know, you did something wrong, which, you know, um, for example, if a person's uh, boundaries are violated, um, a very common, I think, uh, spiritual response is, oh, you manifested this. That is. It's absolutely, you know, it's it's not trauma informed language, and this is gaslighting, it's spiritual bypassing. It doesn't, it's not a way of responding, um, which is sensitive or aware to what a person might be feeling, or you know, to trauma. Full stop. So, this is actually quite rampant, I would say, in the in the spiritual world, um, gaslighting as well. So you know, shifting it back to to the person instead of the facilitator, perhaps taking responsibility for what's kind of going on in the space, um, avoidance uh, or being dismissive or saying, "Oh, you're too sensitive" or so on and so forth. And also another thing of choice and agency. No, when you come to this, you have to wear all white. You have to do this. You have to do that. And if you share like, okay, I might feel safer if, if you know, I sat with, you know, my partner or something, this is my first time. And if they say no, then there it's, yeah, it's, it's just a red flag too. Um, another thing that might be a red flag is um, the constant advice giving. Um, you know, as you talked about, there is, you know, um, a hierarchy with kind of facilitators and kind of participants, you know, facilitators are in kind of the role of, um, of an authority. My belief in a trauma informed way is that a facilitator is there to reflect back the goodness of a human being of a person and to ask the right questions so that they can really elicit the inner wisdom and the empowerment of a participant. So, you know, when I would be wary if, you know, you hear a facilitator say something, you know, along the examples, this is an exaggeration, but, oh, yeah, you know, I saw in the ceremony that you had a blocked heart, you know, and this really means that you have to clear your heart chakra and clear, you know, um, this vision that I saw and you have to see me for, you know, five more sessions after the ceremony. It happens in the plant medicine space uh, and usually is unsolicited. So when it's unsolicited advice of, you know, you know, somebody else seeing something or, you know, so on and so forth uh, without the participant actually asking for that, you know, um, the question and advice, I would I would be wary of that because it it kind of is very unprofessional and borders on exploitation and also, you know, spiritual hustling. <laughs> Um, yeah, which is uh, not very safe, yeah, for for folks out there. So the the better way, I think, for facilitators to um, really support participants while going through a hard time is asking the the right questions that can bring the inner wisdom and the cho and promote the choice and agency of participants. Yeah. No. Um... That's that's fantastic. It um, and again, it goes back to these little things make. I don't even like to call them little things. They're 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 all actions, right? They're all equally, and they have a, a massive impact. And um, and I and I love that what you call the spiritual hustle, right? That's been a something I've been really trying to talk about lately, because again, I see what's happening in the spiritual community, and I mean this with the utmost love and compassion. I know the way that I talk sometimes is just cut and dry. Um, Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not. But um, what I'm seeing is folks go into these circumstances. They go for healing, and they're they're whatever they are. This role, this character, this 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 I'm Kurt, whatever it may be. They go and they have this understanding that they're not that that this that they're not this full identity. But what they do is they just shift to another identity, right? So they're going from one trapped prison of this is who I think I am to a new trapped prison of who I think I am. The new trap just usually has more beads um, and different music and different clothes, but it's just another version of a prison cell to me, just with tapestries in it, right? 
So then with that carries some level of knowing. So then folks have, we just as humans have this, this want to teach, this want to show what I know. And I just think that's a red flag is just seeing that in folks is really paying attention to the ego. Um, mm. Like the work that I do with facilitators is something I call being energetically neutral. Like when you show up in the space, if all these identities, I'm a shaman, I'm a heal, all these, just keep putting it on you, bud, right? All those layers of specialness, of identities, that's exhausting. And that takes energy. Your energy should be completely neutral. I am what I need to be for these participants, nothing more. And it's not an identity I need to shove on you or convince you of. It's like, do you see me? Do I look special? Do you notice all this stuff? Okay, now we're okay. Um, so again, I do, I just see folks moving from one role to another. And that to me is a red flag of looking for folks that are spiritually bypassed and then kind of stepped into these roles and are unqualified to lead you. Yeah. What's, yeah, what, yeah. What's another red flag? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, like all kinds of uh, feels like just to, to continue what you're naming, which I think is, is a very important, I think, um, thing to name and highlight in the plant medicine community. Um, yeah, is, uh, is that of, you know, self-absorption and also narcissism, you know, it's, it's like any other field, um, you know, in, in life, you will find these folks with, you know, certain personality characters and um, some things to look out for is that some of these um, people can be very charismatic, you know, they can um, have this kind of magnetism, uh, they can be very eloquent, very articulate, but quite powerful in their energy. Um, however, underneath that, you know, I think that it's important for participants to have the discernment um, to, to discern, um, is this person really pure of heart? Um, and is this person, you know, entering this role um, as a way perhaps, um, you know, because being a facilitator and being of service, you're completely right. I love the term, you know, being energetically neutral. And it is really when we step on the path, the most humbling path ever, because it will completely destroy the ego. <laughs> um, and that is the path in itself, right? We are really coming, you know, a service as a way of um, connecting to our spirituality as a spiritual path is one that is moving towards an egoless state. So I think that for participants, if you do kind of notice any narcissism or perhaps self-absorption or even exploitation um, through language or actions, um, I would also, you know, share that as, as being a, a red flag um, and watching out for, um, yeah, the, 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 the show and the persona and also noticing what is behind the persona. Yeah if that is something that, you know, folks resonate with and, and feel safe. Because for me, when I see a person with the garb and, you know, the, the show, for instance, the, you know, if it's a performative thing that doesn't come from a sincere place, my body really cringes. And I kind of, I notice that my body wants to turn away or, you know, my belly just doesn't feel quite right. And there are many times that I have just got up, walked out, you know, certain situations because, you know, it's, it's just not right. Yeah. So I would also invite participants to know that they have the choice and the right to do that, that they can walk up and leave at any point. And there's nothing wrong with that because their safety is first and is a priority. Yeah. And, and, if, and, you, and if a person talks to, let's say, brings that up to a facilitator, notice how the person responses. You know, if the person, you know, a facilitator is defensive or is not able to or willing to listen, that's 100% a red flag. Or if a person goes into a gaslighting kind of pattern or, you know, um, you know, advice giving or putting it on, you know, the participant that the participant is wrong, that's absolutely a red flag. And, you know, I would say that um, their yeah, safety is really compromised. The last thing that I would um, share uh, with folks is really around integration support. So as you probably know, you know, the path it doesn't end with the ceremony. It actually starts after the ceremony is finished. 
um, into the process that's called integration and also embodiment. So I would, um, yeah, just encourage folks to uh, notice if facilitators, you know, number one, even speak about integration, because um, this is a subject I think that's often overlooked. Uh, if they explain what integration is, the process of integration, if they offer any integration support and any kind of understanding on trauma and what it's like to go from a ceremonial space back into the routine of everyday life and the importance of support and resources. So I would, you know, um, suggest to folks out there that are looking for the right facilitator does this facilitator offer integration support does this you know for facilitator talk about what's going to happen after the experience are they going to give tips and tools uh, about perhaps you know anchoring or embodying some of the realizations that uh, are in plant medicine and if they don't you know, share or talk about any of these things, I would say that that's a red flag or not offer any kind of support of integration. Another red flag that I would like to also name, which is uh, a little, I think it's a trend in the plant medicine world these days and not super helpful for the recovery of trauma is the, the mixing and the high doses of medicine in a single experience. So there is a trend, I think, these days where it's, um, you know, let's do, you know, five ceremonies of ayahuasca and two ceremonies of bufo and two ceremonies of wachuma. We're doing rapé, sananga and, you know, like combo on the first day. And for me, this is very much a red flag, especially with survivors of trauma. This is very activating for the nervous system. It actually blows up the nervous system and it leads to greater states of disassociation. And it's not particularly helpful for people who are going through trauma. And I cannot, I cannot kind of emphasize this enough. You know, in the recovery of trauma, you know, slow, going slow and going a little bit by little bit to process the trauma, you know, step by step, to go at, you know, a person's time signature. Um, to feel resourced enough to kind of process the next bit of the trauma imprint that's arising, that is very, very important. So for facilitators that are offering this package of, you know, do it harder, you're going to drink three cups or five cups or so on and so forth, you know, and you got to do it for 12 hours. And that is extreme. <laughs> I'm getting stressed talking about it, but that is really uh, I would say a, a, an indicator of this facilitator not being trauma-informed and being unaware of um yeah of of of, of trauma awareness principles um and it could be an indicator that they don't have additional tools right what I find is if you don't have the ability the tools to help folks integrate that experience work with that experience um melt with that experience so to speak well, you just give them more experiences right, right so right. let me fill in my inefficiencies with more medicine and then hope yeah. that the medicine gives them an experience that they will relate to what we're doing here um and it's and it's dangerous i mean especially my concern is <clears throat> um to, to yours is the mixing of these medicines absolutely now everybody wants to have their own magical cocktail right? Like, yeah. oh, we have special knowledge. So we do it this way, right? That's, that's what I'm feeling. And again, that's just how I interpret people sometimes is the specialness of it of, well, that's how they, they do it. But we've created with our specialness, this new way of doing it, even though for thousands and thousands of years, right? <clears throat> culturally, it's been done this way. But you somehow you know, in your six months of working with this medicine have created the best way of using it, right? That's usually a concern to me. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that might, that could be true. And also I like to just name that we do live in a consumerist society and a culture where um, we, you know, con we lean more towards going very hard, very fast in an activated way. Um, where we just want to consume and have more and more experiences. Um, so I think that part of it is also, you know, the culture that we we grow up in and and um, which, you know, highlights that. Um, yeah, so in a, 
in a plant medicine ceremony, it is sacred. We are not going to a rave where, you know, we take, you know, have a pill here, have a tab there, you know, it's really a sacred space and that really needs to be protected um, with a lot of care and also the understanding of the foundations of trauma that when things happen very fast and there's too much of it, it really spins people out and it's very re-traumatizing because it's too overwhelming for their nervous system. It's, and, it, and it's dangerous. Again, the mixing of some of these items, the heavy doses, and again, the, just my experience with all of the, the malleable medicines is I'd like somebody to be in a space where it is malleable. They're able to work with it. If they're purely in a space of survival, I don't know how much work is really happening right yeah so some of these heavier doses i just don't find there there's there, there's really any utility in them um mm -hmm. the other concern i have <clears throat> is again the shoving of so many ceremonies in such a short period of time to your point you're having this 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 amazing you're having an experience that's going to take time to integrate what do you do with it but before most folks have even thought about what to do with it here's another one Right. Mm. And then tomorrow we've got another one for you. And it's again, that integration process is one of the most important pieces of the process. What do we do with it? But a lot of times they're not even getting the time to figure out what to do with it before the next one takes place. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that's one of the concerns to me is, is you nailed it to make ours more marketable. We'll do more things in a shorter period of time to make it valuable to you. And I, I don't think mm -hmm. that is more valuable. I actually think it's um, detrimental. Absolutely. I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got a few more minutes. I, some of the pieces that we were talking about were the integration. Um, and uh, obviously, folks know that I've done nothing but talk about my experience of your classes, the things that you're teaching and the importance of, 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 of those, the lessons and the things that I've learned. Everything that you talked about today now has a completely different understanding to me and a deeper meaning. Mm -hmm. And it's more mm -hmm. impactful. It makes sense. Um, and once you learn those things, as you step into the space, it changes everything that you see. So mm -hmm. I think to have this trauma informed lens is a necessity, right? Mm -hmm. Just my opinion for folks that are, especially in our culture, because what you, you, you nailed, some of the things that we talk about, the specialness, the entry, that's all weaned out when you're pulled from a child and trained up to these positions of facilitators. When you're somebody that had a few experiences, decide you want to be a facilitator and step into that role, that is not weaned out. And that's why we're having these conversations because mm -hmm. facilitators here are different. And, and that's okay. I don't I don't want to put that down necessarily, but that difference is important to understand and then mm -hmm. why we're having these dialogues. Um, so for me, as folks ask me about places to go and understanding that I do facilitate on occasion and it's a conflict of interest, although it's from my standpoint, it is not. I recommend folks do find somebody that is a, a trauma-informed plant medicine facilitator. And I'm going to have you talk about that program. The two programs, I think she mentioned two things. One, the proper facilitation and two, the integration of it. Those mm -hmm. two skill sets, if you don't have those, I maybe this is wrong to say, I don't know why you're facilitating, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to have those specific trainings, but if you don't have training in those areas, I don't know what you're doing facilitating yet. You could be causing more harm than good. And then participants stepping in, we're asking you to do a little homework, do a little research. But I also understand from my own background and my own journey that when I was in a traumatized state and I was desperate need of healing, mm -hmm. some of these red flags just went right by me because mm -hmm. I would have taken anybody because I was desperate. Mm -hmm. So having these, this curriculum, this TIPM, you know, these mm -hmm. accreditations, these, these signs to me makes it easier for participants to know that somebody is qualified. And I think that's the importance of the work that you're doing. That's why I want to continue to drive it because I want folks to, hey, they're a TIPM. That's a big chunk of the homework I already have to do. Now it's more mm -hmm. of a, am I connecting with this facilitator? So can you tell us about those programs and then how folks can get involved? Yeah, so I teach two programs annually. So one is the Trauma-Informed Plant Medicine Facilitation Program. It's a three-month program, online program, um, and it 
really goes in depth into facilitation, so trauma informed facilitation, what to do in the ceremonial space, what not to do, how to be trauma informed and attune and extend, you know, the right kind of repair and care to participants. The next module is about orientation and also about you know, preparing folks for the ceremony and also in the intention. And, you know, perhaps some um, participants that might not be, um, you know, plant medicine is not for everybody. And there are some people that have certain, um, you know, symptoms or signs where actually they actually need, um, you know, different kinds of care. So how do we look out for that as a facilitator? And the third one is around integration and post-ceremony care. So what to do to really, you know, help people settle and create that time and that space uh, in a safe trauma-informed approach where participants can really embody the realizations that they have received in the plant medicine experience instead of moving to the next experience and the next experience as you shared. So this is coming up usually in March to May, and people can also buy that as an online self-paced study program if they want on my website. And the other course that I, I really love teaching is the Somatic Plant Medicine Integration Program, which is um, a practitioner program for folks who are interested in, you know, in the integration process. And it teaches a methodology, uh, which is a, a somatic approach and how to really help people anchor and, and create meaning in their experiences. Um, so, yeah, those are two programs that I run and that I love running. Uh, we are also running uh, master classes that I'm really excited about. So I think Kirby, you were part of the first master class uh, working with Bufo. So master classes are just really bite-sized chunks for anybody to attend, where you can learn um, very um, practical, applicable kind of tips and tools in creating a more trauma-informed space for your participants. Uh, we have one on working with ayahuasca coming up, and we are going to be sharing more of these master classes in the future. I, I think it's great. And again, um, I took, I've taken both the classes. She probably knows anything she comes out with, I'll probably take. Um, and the trauma-informed plant medicine facilitator curriculum, there's a lot of curriculum out there. It's a deep, deep dive. I've had to go mm -hmm. back to it myself a couple of times because there's so much information. This isn't a two hour Udemy certification course for 50 bucks, right? <laughs> right. Not, not to knock that course. Um, <laughs> this is the real deal. Um, yeah. it's the real deal. It's going to take some time. Um, you're going to have to commit to it and put in some effort, but do you want mm -hmm. anything that's not that level? Right. Um, because that's the whole point of what we're talking about is how do we create a better level for what's happening? We're stepping into spaces with a huge responsibility, right? We need to be trained and then continue to train. And that's one of the big pieces that I'm continuing to push. That's why I love the master class. Yeah. I was honored to do one with her with, with Atira. There's other ones going on on ayahuasca. They continue to come. They're inexpensive. They're reasonably priced. Go on. You will learn from these things. But to me, if you're considering stepping into this space, even as just a space holder, understand the responsibility, how folks are coming in physiologically, uh, trauma, how that all operates so you can navigate this landscape properly. Um, and actually really help folks by not creating more additional trauma. It's almost like the, the Hippocratic Oath to me, it's just do no, cause no more harm almost as like as a starting point is, but again, I think folks step in with that intention, but again, because of un, untraining or unknowing, inadvertently can cause harm. So yeah. thank you for what you're doing. Um, in closing, anything you'd like to share with folks, how to get a hold of you, anything that you'd like to close with? Sure. Well, I just like really to extend a deep gratitude to you, Kirby, and also to everybody that's that's listening out there. Um, if you'd like to know more about my work, you can jump on my website at tiratan.com and follow me on Instagram at tiratan. Um, I would also love to invite you know folks out there just as you to share this information with other people. And I think by spreading awareness around, uh, we can help to keep our community safe. Um, and that's really, I think, really important um, for those, you know, our world at the moment is that felt sense of safety. So thank you so much, Kirby. It's been such a pleasure to chat to you today. Well, thank you as always for taking the time. I appreciate having you.